And good evening. Welcome to the Mythical Ireland Library. I'm Anthony Murphy. It's Monday evening and that means only one thing. It's time for live Irish Myths. Good evening. We are on episode 160 this evening and the plan for this evening is to continue reading the wonderful Irish fairy tales by James Stevens. Tonight we are reading the story called Oisin's Mother and I'm looking forward to that. Our readings of, of uh, uh, Stevens' material has been uh, uh, entertaining uh, uh, and uh, quaint, interesting, beguiling, you know, bewitching even. You're all very welcome. If you're popping in to say hello on either Facebook or YouTube, don't forget to say hello. We'll say hello back. We're uh, streaming simultaneously on the Mythical Ireland Facebook page and also on the Mythical Ireland YouTube channel. It's facebook.com forward slash Mythical Ireland and youtube.com forward slash Mythical Ireland, I hope. Uh, if somebody is on the Mythical Ireland page, they might share the live stream over to the Mythical Ireland community. Uh, that would be great if uh, somebody would do that as well. But anyway, good evening to all and sundry. Hope everybody's keeping safe and well. Sandra Boothroyd is the first to say hello this evening. Evening, Sandra. Welcome along. Um, hmm, hang on. We are not live streaming on, are we? Hang on. Switch account. That's what's wrong. Yes. I'm on the wrong account. Signed into the wrong account on YouTube. There you go. Aha, there we go. Brilliant. And Bernardine is uh, saying, well, it's Bernadette in Maine. Hello, Bernadette in Maine. Good afternoon to you. You're very welcome along. Yvette Tillema uh, says that she loves this tale. Brilliant stuff, Yvette. I wonder if you're reading the book along with us. Dunworks says, hello, Falja Gaji on Lowerland Show. Stephen O'Hara is in the house saying hello from a starry Kilkenny. Yes. It has turned cold. At last, the wintry weather is here. I don't mean that as if we were welcoming it, but we have had a lot of mild weather, but we've also had a lot of very grey overcast days. Wonderful to see blue skies and sunshine. Cold, though. Frosty, misty start and a cold day. It's going to be a cold night. And in fact, the forecast says it's going to be a cold week here in Ireland. So keep the blanket and the iron jumper and the uh, hot chocolate close at hand. Or... If you fancy something stronger, maybe a drop of the old crather. Joe Butler is in Colorado. Desiree Riley stopped by. Great visit. Brilliant stuff. This is what's happening. The two are finally meeting up. Well, we're not post-pandemic yet. Certainly not with the way numbers are going here. But certainly it's lovely to see that. And uh, Bernadette says it's lovely to see everyone. Brilliant stuff as it is. Lovely to see you. Jason is uh, saying it's another lovely day in Dale Hollow Lake. Brilliant to hear that, Jason. Hope you are keeping well. Welcome to the live stream, Daisy Peters. Hello, Anthony and all our two. Glad to be here. Looking forward to our episode. Brilliant. Always a pleasure to have you along, Daisy. Hope you're sitting comfortably. Shannon Donahue is uh, in snowy Alaska. Thrilled to have the day off and get to tune in live today. Brilliant stuff, Shannon. A pleasure to have you for the live stream. Rose Corain. Uh, I'm on time. Good evening, all. <laughs> Don't worry, I won't be berating the latecomers this evening. I'll just be embarrassing the hell out of them. <laughs> Anne McCallum is in the house. Hello, Anton and the mighty, the almighty Tua. Hope everyone is doing well. Really enjoyed the beginning pages of your new book and also your lovely, interesting story, When George Met Martin. Only available to patrons at the moment. So if you want the juicy, juicy, juicy stuff, why not consider signing up to become a patron of Mythical Ireland at this point? address here patreon.com forward slash mythical ireland look at that isn't that a thing of beauty isn't it yeah get over there and sign up at the bronze age level and above to see the uh the uh, typescript of my new book as it's written an exclusive for patrons there you go mandy mccurl is saying hello to everyone and saying that it's a beautiful day on the isle of mull did you watch the planets this evening and those of you who are in the states what time is it? 8 p.m. Ireland, 3 p.m. on the east coast of the States. So it's not dark there yet. But when it does get dark in the States, don't forget to look up for that. Look out for that lovely planetary lineup. Jupiter in the south, high in the south, lovely and bright. Venus low in the southwest, lovely and bright. And between them, Jupiter, sorry, between them, Saturn, uh, which isn't quite as bright. And uh, if you have a telescope, Pluto is, Pluto is there somewhere as well. Guido Bruce is uh, saying good evening from a cold Netherlands. Well, it seems that that is the theme. We are heading, what are we now, a month 
away from winter solstice, just over a month away from Christmas. It's about time that uh, winter showed itself. Elaine Dent Lingenfelter says uh, that it's a beautiful day and the sun is shining in Texas. Brilliant stuff, Elaine. Share that sunshine, definitely. John Main says, Banati to a wonderful tour. Looking forward to another enlightening gathering with everyone. Brilliant stuff, John. Pleasure to have you in the house. Hope life in Gundy Mayo is treating you well. Mariana Dunn is uh, giving thanks for the Mythical Ireland community with this Thanksgiving week in the US. And of course, absolutely, yes. A very happy Thanksgiving to all our viewers in the States. And Scott Doherty just got in from a visit to the Forge just in time to tune in. Glad to be in the Boyne Valley. Wow. You're fairly local again, Anne. It's, you are well-traveled. It's brilliant. But um, yeah, glad that you got a chance to say hello to Tom. Uh, the full Irish, uh, Gary, is in Tala. Another fine day on the sod. Yes, cold, but if you can tolerate the cold, I tell you, the brightness is a thing to behold. Britt Griffin is in Northern Ontario. Glad to be here for my first time. And it's snowing. Brilliant stuff. Sounds very Christmassy, Britt, altogether. But you're very welcome to the live stream. Hope you enjoy your time here. Liam Smith says hello to Anthony Ann, the two uh, Liam Falje, uh, Jock, and uh, Trinonoa. Uh, Paul Campbell says it's easy to share this Facebook live event on your own Facebook news feed so others can see now or later by pressing the share icon and then pressing right post and then pressing the post icon. Brilliant stuff, Paul. Thanks as always for the uh, for spreading the word. Adina Sparks is in the house. Missed last week, but glad to be here today. Your absence was noted. <laughs> <laughs> Joke. <laughs> ah. uh, what's they say about Santa Claus now? He's making a list. He's checking it twice. He's going to be in breach of the general GDP or EU regulations. <laughs> uh, Ty, otherwise known as Archaeostronomy Database, is saying hello, my friends. Always a treat to meet with you all, as it is our honor and pleasure to have you along. Uh, Ty, hope everything is well with you and all yours. Mandy McCurl is saying hello to everyone. Falchie. Falchie, Jock, absolutely. Aaron Durrett is in the house, taking care of my goddaughter. So in and out today. That's okay, Aaron. You might be able to catch up on the uh, on the replay. Good to see you, by the way. Hope life is treating you well. Erica Bow is in the house. Take a bow for Erica Bow. Good afternoon to all. We are honoured with your presence, Erica. Hope life is treating you well. Don Hilton is in Lancashire. Uh, great to be here again. Brilliant stuff, Don. Always glad to see you among the uh, the audience. Yes, the second hundred is taking longer, Paul points out. Yes, indeed, because the first hundred were done day after day after day, every day for a hundred and what is a hundred and two or a hundred and three, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, mad times. Caitlin Moon is in the house. Hello from Chile, Dublin. We got me calendar last week. Brilliant stuff. Thank you for the reminder. Don't forget. <laughs> Need I remind you, 2022 Mythical Ireland calendar is now available for immediate dispatch around the world. Brilliant news. The first of the pre-orders that were shipped last week to the United States, several of them arrived in five days. Uh, I think posted on Tuesday and arrived on Saturday. Brilliant stuff. So at, at this moment in time, all every one of the pre-orders is gone all dispatched and anybody who has ordered since lunchtime today all orders are gone in the post anybody who ordered in the afternoon your orders will go out tomorrow morning so there you go your mythical ireland 2022 calendar it's a3 it's got loads of pictures on the back this year which you didn't have before it's 13 euros plus postage and packaging um and we can post anywhere in the world get straight on the website that's mythicalireland.com by the way, mythicalireland.ie also works. It says, to make sure that it actually still does work. Mythical Ireland, no. <laughs> In fact, forget about .ie for the moment. I obviously need to uh, point that to the right to servers because we did change servers a while ago. Mythicalireland.com and go to the gallery and shop. And in the drop down, you'll see calendar. Make sure to order the 2022 calendar. Unless you want a 2021 calendar, I still have a few of those left but there's only like a month and a week left of 2021. 
Anyway, Caitlin, thank you for the reminder. Good to see you in the house. Brendan Byrne, who is in Glendalough in County Wicklow, says, good evening all. Brendan, I'm sure it's beautiful down there at the moment between the, you know, the, uh, the colours of the autumn leaves falling off the trees and the frosty, misty mornings. It must be magical down there. Desiree is in the house. Hello to all the two. Yes, Ms. Joe cooked me steak and let my puppies run around for a while, which was much needed on my long drive back home to Louisiana to visit family for Thanksgiving. I just love this community. Me, so many beautiful people in this group, also wearing pendant. Tom King sent me and bringing my mom hers. Hey, hey, hey. that makes 17 of us. That makes 700 of us. Desiree, brilliant to see you. I hope you're well. And obviously you are. And uh, great to hear that the pups got a bit of a run around the place as well. Anne McCallum is in the house. Did I say hello already, Anne? Uh, I have some emails from you that I didn't answer yet. Please forgive me. Um, uh, I'll get back to that. those backlog of correspondence due to major commitments and a COVID scare. Um, Tom King's in the house uh, saying hello to Anton all the mighty too. I hope all are good fettle. Delighted to have Anne and Michael at the Forge today. What a pleasure. It's now story time. I'm looking forward. Brilliant stuff, Tom. And I hope the forge is well lit and keeping you warm under those beautiful mead stars. Elaine Dent, Lingenfelter, you and herself can pop down here Thursday and we'll treat, treat you to a Thanksgiving dinner. Woo! <laughs> Sounds good. Absolute. I never refuse dinner. Barbara Murphy is saying hello from Tucson. And uh, that's in Arizona, I believe. Barbara, always a pleasure to welcome another Murphy into this. Mark Gordon says hello. Mark, I believe, is in Iowa. Good afternoon, uh, Mark. Hope you are keeping great. Janet Moran says, oops, I almost forgot. It's cloudy in Boston. Oh, no. Wow, it's clear everywhere else, but cold. Cloudy in Boston. Let's all simultaneously uh, blow those clouds away from Boston. Uh, Porik Bourne is saying good evening from Mount Melick in County Leash. Hello, Porik. Good evening to you. Thanks for joining the live stream. Helen Hirsch Chatter is in the house. Greetings all. Ha ha. Greetings to you, Helen. Yes, indeed. I think it might be Giddy Night. No, that was last week, Brendan. No, 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 no. Or was that the week before? Certainly had a couple of rowdy ones lately, didn't we? Or Giddy ones. Cynthia Fowler is in Texas. Good afternoon, Cynthia. Thank you for joining uh, Live Irish Mits. Won't be able to chat much because I'm able to get back on the road. Stop to get gas and turn on Mythflix, but I'll be listening. Brilliant stuff to Zira. Well, safe journey from all of us. Lara Herbert says, how's it going? Oh, oh, oh. You too, Anthony. Going grand, Lara. How's things with you? Adam Rory Porter, shared now on Wild Atlantic Way, Makara. Oh, brilliant. Wonderful stuff, as always. Hard to beat a wee live vid from yourself on Irish mythical loveliness. Seldom do I get to watch live, but always catch up. Uh, if any of you don't know, Adam Rory Porter is a very, very talented photographer and astronomer who lives in Donegal under very dark skies. Lucky him. And uh, shares some wonderful stuff. Go look him up on Facebook and give him a follow. He's fantastic. Robert Friend is in the house. From a chilly paisley in Scotland, was camping near Minard on Loch Fine Saturday and Sunday. Just dodge the easterly chill. It's gone chilly everywhere now in this neck of the woods anyway. And uh, you've just reminded me of Paisley in Scotland was the place where our good friend uh, Kelly Edmiston was living uh, when she uh, sadly passed away. And uh, we miss her on the live streams very greatly. Uh, who am I missing? Ooh, yes, loads and loads of people saying hello. Samantha Healy is one of those. Good evening, Samantha. Slauncha. Um Somebody help Mark with the definition of Tua. It's literally just tribe, your people, you know, your tribe, your family, maybe, you know. Uh, Henry McCauley says, hello from the Isle of Gigha. Where is that? Please, Henry, tell me. Teach me some geography. That's one I'm not familiar with. Charlie Grover is in the house. Falcha, Slauncha, Charlie. Welcome along. Make yourself comfortable. Aaron Durrett is so glad to be with us all again. Uh, Aaron, it's just brilliant to have you in the house. Catherine Woodruff is in Wisconsin, where it's chilly. Chilly is the buzzword. Yes. And uh, Nora Gaffney, Connor O'Connor, sea is Baltic. Why do you go in there then? Are you absolutely nuts? <laughs> Nora, it's a pleasure to see you. I was talking about you today to a friend of mine. He took his dog for a walk out one of the local beaches here. And he said, there were people swimming in the sea. I said, there's this lady who watches the live streams every week. And she swims in the day in the sea every day. I didn't tell him you were nuts, though. Honestly, I didn't. Anyway, we are on, let's call it 15 minutes. And we can get started with 
the story, uh, I think. Yes, I, I mentioned the COVID scare, nothing major. And, and to be honest, just one of those things. Last Thursday, I lost my sense of taste and smell. Couldn't taste anything, couldn't smell anything. And uh, just to really put it to the test, on Thursday evening, before I went to bed, I poured myself a dram of whiskey. Bushmills, you'll be glad to hear. And I couldn't taste it. I couldn't smell it. Not even the slightest. I knew it was whiskey because, you know, you can still get that sensation in your mouth, on your tongue, you know. But uh, no smell, no taste. Next morning, I uh, spoke to my sister-in-law who works in a pharmacy. And she said, yeah, get an antigen test. And uh, so we'll... Uh, and and brought home an antigen test and uh, that turned up negative but i the advice then was look absolutely you need to get a pcr test because you have symptoms of covid so got the pcr appointment friday afternoon and on saturday evening the text message came through to say negative which was uh, i'll be honest a relief uh covid numbers are extremely high here Something worth bearing in mind is that 54% of people who have been in the intensive care units of Irish hospitals in the last two months have been unvaccinated. And you might say that means 46% of vaccinated people are in ICU. But remember that only 7% of the Irish population is on adult population over 18 is unvaccinated. So it means that 54% who are in ICU, that is from a much, much smaller body of people than the 46% who are vaccinated. Anyway. I know one or two people will undoubtedly comment on the video afterwards on YouTube telling me to stop promoting, you know, garbage and uh, uh, spouting out uh, anti-vaccine nonsense. But if you're on the Mythical Ireland channel and you're a flat earther or you're an anti-vaxxer or you're a conspiracy theorist, you're in the wrong place, mate. There you go. Anyway. Balorus, I sincerely doubt that. I sincerely doubt that. So, if if, if, if I, I tell you, if you if you think we're going to get into a discussion about vaccines, I'm telling you how I feel about it, and I'm telling you that I advise absolutely everybody to get vac vaccinated. Vaccines save lives. It's really as simple as that. Adele Perth, good morning to you. Great to see you from Australia hope life is treating you well and i'm hoping that it's not going to be too long down the line before you're able to come back to ireland you know but Belorus, please go, look don't start preaching i'm not even going to show your comment i think i suspect you're just here just to cause so like we're not talking vaccines anymore you've heard my opinion and this is my storytelling channel i'm not getting into a discussion with you about vaccines Take it somewhere else, mate. Absolutely. Thank you. Now, story time. Good on you, Sue. Brilliant. Doing your bit for society. And the fact, by the way, that 93% of uh, uh, over 18s in Ireland have taken the vaccine really, really, I think, really puts to bed that silly argument among the anti-vaccine brigade if you were judging by facebook alone you would imagine that the majority of people aren't getting vaccinated but it just so happens that they're they seem to shout the loudest as my mother says you know empty vessels make the most noise anyway that's enough of that far too much controversy of a monday evening we're here for fun and enjoyment and stories this is Oshin's mother, and we are continuing from the wonderful uh, James Stevens's Irish fairy tales, first published in 1924, and every bit as beautiful as it was when it was first published. I hope you agree. Thank you. Evening was drawing nigh. And the Fianna Finn had decided to hunt no more that day. The hounds were whistled to heel and a sober homeward march began. For men will walk soberly in the evening, however they go in the day, and dogs will take the mood from their masters. They were pacing so through the golden shafted tender coloured eve, when a fawn leaped suddenly from covert and with that leap, 
all quietness vanished. The men shouted, the dogs gave tongue, and a furious chase commenced. Fionn loved a chase at any hour, and with Bran and Skjolon, he had outstripped the men and the dogs of his troop, until nothing remained in the limpid world but Fionn, the two hounds, and the nimble, beautiful fawn. And if you saw the graphic for today's uh, uh, episode, uh, that is a drawing that is taken from this book. These, I think they're pen and ink drawings. Um, and you can see the two hounds there uh, and the fawn um, in their merry gamble or their merry, merry chase. And that formed the backdrop, the background um, for the uh, for the graphic. Uh, Mandy, you did well. Ordered a copy of Stephen's Day for a fiver. I'm telling you, it's it's gold. It's absolute gold. And uh, one of our Tua was lucky recently to acquire an original hardback copy uh, for which a lot more than a fiver was handed over. But talk about gold dust, you know. Lillian Cruz is in the house. Hello, Lillian. Great to see you. And uh, yeah, welcome along. And I hope you enjoy the story. These and the occasional boulders round which they raced or over which they scrambled, the solitary tree which dozed aloof and beautiful in the path, the occasional clump of trees that hived sweet shadow as a hive towards honey, and the rustling grass that stretched to infinity, and that moved and crept and swung under the breeze in endless rhythmic billowings. In his wildest moment, Fionn was thoughtful, and now, although running hard, he was thoughtful. There was no movement of his beloved hounds that he did not know. Not a twitch or fling of the head, not a cock of the ears or tail that was not significant to him. But in this chase, whatever signs the dog gave were not understood by their master. He had never seen them in such eager flight. They were almost utterly absorbed in it, but they did not whine with eagerness, nor did they cast any glance towards him for the encouraging word which he never failed to give when they sought it. They did look at him, but it was a look which he could not comprehend. There was a question and a statement in those deep eyes, and he could not understand what that question might be, nor what it was they sought to convey. Now and again, one of the dogs turned in ahead in full flight and stared not at Fionn, but distantly backwards over the spreading and swelling plain where their companions of the hunt had disappeared. Michelle Terrell is saying, hello, everyone. Happy to hear you test negative. Just got my booster. Brilliant stuff. Nula Doyle is in the house. Hello, Nula. Welcome along. <laughs> a, a merry gamble. Yes, perhaps. I'm not sure if that was quite the correct phrase to describe it. But anyway, they are looking for the other hounds, said Fionn. And yet they do not give tongue. Tongue it, Avran, he shouted. Bell it out, Achyolon. And, and uh, those are the pronunciations. Uh, Avran, because Bran, when you say Avran, would be lenited. So it would be, be a, a separate word, B-H-R-A-N, pronounced V-R-A-N. And Achyolon, S-H-E-O for the L-A-N, Achyolon. Bell it out, Achyolon. It was then they looked at him, the look which he could not understand and had never seen on a chase. They did not tongue it nor bell it, but they added silence to silence and speed to speed until the lean grey bodies were one pucker and lashing of movement. Fionn marvelled. They do not want the other dogs to hear or to come on this chase, he murmured, and he wondered what might be passing within those slender heads. <laughs> Felimi McFadgin is watching from Ballyhillen in Malinhead. Wow. 
the most northerly point on the uh, island of Ireland. Uh, very good evening to you, Felimi. And uh, I'm not sure if this is your first time watching Live Irish Mits. If it is, you're very welcome. The fawn runs well, his thought continued. What is it of ran my heart? After her, a hyolon. Hissed and away, my loves. <laughs> there is going and... Let me just check this sentence before I read it in full. Yes, this is exactly what it says. There is going and to spare in that beast yet, his mind went on. Okay. There is going in that beast, as in with plenty of, you know, energy and life in it. She is not stretched to the full, nor half stretched. She may outrun even Bran, he thought ragingly. They were racing through a smooth valley in a steady, beautiful, speedy flight when suddenly the fawn stopped and lay on the grass and it lay with the calm of an animal that has no fear and the leisure of one that he's not pressed. Here is a change, said Fionn, staring in astonishment. She is not winded, he said. What is she lying down for? But Bran and Skjolon did not stop. They added another inch to their long stretched easy bodies and came up on the fawn. It is an easy kill, said Fionn regretfully. They have her, he cried. But he was again astonished, for the dogs did not kill. They leaped and played about the fawn, licking its face and rubbing delighted noses against its neck. Fionn came up then. His long spear was lowered in his fist at the thrust and his sharp knife was in its sheath. But he did not use them, for the fawn and the two hounds began to play round him, and the fawn was as affectionate towards him as the hounds were, so that when a velvet nose was thrust in his palm, it was as, as often a fawn's muzzle as a hound's. In that joyous company, he came to wide Allen of Leinster, that's the plain of Allen, where the people were surprised to see the hounds and the fawn and the chief and none other of the hunters that had set out with them. When the others reached home, the chief told of his chase, and it was agreed that such a fawn must not be killed, but that it should be kept and well treated, and that it, it should be the pet fawn of the Fianna. But some of those who remembered Bran's parentage thought that as Bran herself had come from the she. So this fawn might have come out of the she also. And that is the end of chapter one. One of seven. Better get a move on. <laughs> chapter two. Late that night, when he was preparing for rest, the door of Fionn's chamber opened gently and a young woman came into the room. The captain stared at her, as he well might, for he had never seen or imagined to see a woman so beautiful as this was. Indeed, she was not a woman, but a young girl, and her bearing was so gently noble, her look so modestly high, that the champion dared scarcely look at her, although he could not by any means have looked away. As she stood within the doorway, smiling, and shy as a flower, beautifully timid as a fawn, the chief communed with his heart. She is the sky woman of the dawn, he said. She is the light on the foam. She is white and odorous as an apple blossom. She smells of spice and honey. She is my beloved beyond the women of the world. She shall never be taken from me. Uh, Donna Ferrer asks a question. Do animals frequently come from the she? Well, it's probably more a case that those of the she can take animal form. So, for instance, Angus and Care in Ashlinga Angusso in the form of swans, Englec, um, 
no, no, forgive me, not Englick, Etain uh, and Midger take the form of swans to escape from Yochi Aram in the third part of Tuchmark Etain. Uh, Fintan transforms into a, a salmon, a hawk, and an eagle. Curiously, he transforms initially into a salmon in a cave uh, on the peak of Tultinja in Tipperary, which suggests to me that he was in a passage tomb or something similar. Uh, other transformations, again, Etain in Tuchmark Etain is transformed into a scarlet fly, sometimes described as a butterfly. Um, their transformations. Um, uh, Bowen, or as she was alternatively known, Ethna uh, went into Sheed and Broga at Newgrange in the form of uh, a lap dog. What else am I missing? I'm missing several others, I'm sure. But there are some examples. And I'm not so sure that it's necessarily that animals come from the she. It's more that uh, the, the Daedanans were able to shapeshift and transform into animals. That's a great question, by the way. Royal Till of, Hill of Tower Ranger is in the house, in the turf shed, apparently. <laughs> Don't know what you're doing in there, Paul. <laughs> With a Springer Spaniel. Well, good. That uh, redeems it immediately. <laughs> and that thought was delight and anguish to him. Delight because of such sweet prospect. Anguish because it was not yet realised and might not be. As the dogs had looked at him on the chase with a look that he did not understand. So she looked at him. And in her, in her regard, there was a question that baffled him and a statement which he could not follow. Uh, and who was it that transformed into a deer? Well, we're reading that one, I believe, unless there's another one. Um... Oh, the name escapes me. What Somebody else will know. Uh, what is the other? I think she's female. Uh Associated with the two of the Danon, who's su su supposed to be able to take the form or comes in the form of a deer. Um, oh, Fleish? No, not Fleish. It's something beginning with F, is it? Somebody might have an answer to that, Movanway. I will have an answer after the episode when I can go searching through the library. Uh, if you don't get an answer in the meantime, do please ask the question again, maybe on an email. He spoke to her then, mastering his heart to do it. I do not seem to know you, he said. You do not know me indeed, she replied. It is the more wonderful, he continued gently, for I should know every person that is here. What do you require from me? I beg your protection, royal captain. I give that to all, he answered. Against whom do you desire protection? I am in terror of the far Doraka, which literally means the dark man. I think dark Doraka. Can a shapeshifter become trapped in the form they take? Is there a very um, widely told tale, Brendan, about uh, the black pig uh, and about a school headmaster who uh, was a bit of a, a druid? And obviously I think it's a uh, a folk, uh, a, a late a medieval folk version of an earlier myth. Um, but what he was doing was every day, I tell this story on my Drogheda Myths and Legends walk. By the way, the next one of those is on this Saturday. If you're interested, you can book tickets on boynevalleytrails.ie. Um, and so what happens is at break time in school, he taps the children on the head with his wand and turns them into hounds and other creatures. And they go out into the yard and they're so boisterous and full of energy. And when they come back in, then he taps them in the head and turns them back into humans. But when they go home, they're all exhausted. And the parents are like asking, you know, little Sean and little Mary, you know, what's going on? Why are you so tired? And they explain what has happened. And so the parents say to the kids angrily, you know, Right, we'll get you to get your own back on him. So instead of allowing him to change you into a creature tomorrow, 
tell him to tap himself on the head with his wand and turn himself into a creature. And he turned himself into a pig. He, he, uh, he agrees to this and he taps himself on the head with his wand and he turns into a pig. The problem is that pigs don't have ha hands or fingers, uh, cloven hooves and all that. And he can't pick up the wand to tap himself on the head to turn back into a human. And so angrily, he goes across the country, rutting up the earth, tearing up the ground, leaving this huge uh, trench and banks either side of it, which apparently is the story that gives rise to an archaeological feature called the Black Pig's Dyke that runs across the country from the northwest to the northeast, from roughly speaking, from County Sligo into sort of counties Monaghan and Down, etc. Uh, but that's the story that he was unable to transform himself back. Um, a similar story, sort of, is told of Lou's father, Kean. In, uh, in in a story that's either part of Kotmoitura or is associated with it, that um, uh, oh, it's the children of Turin, isn't it? Uh, that um, uh, uh, they're after him, and he disguises himself as a pig, um, and sort of mixes in with a a herd of pigs on the plain of Murahevna, but. Uh, one of the brothers turns the other two into bloodhounds and they sniff out the pig and they catch up on him and um, uh, they're going to kill him and he begs to be turned back into human form, which they allow, but they kill him in human form for which there's a much greater blood price to be paid than if he'd been killed as a pig. Hope that answers your question, Brendan. The only one that I'm immediately aware of is the story of the black pig, the headmaster who turned himself into a pig and was unable to transform back into a human. Tarini Pendleton has joined us from Laguna Beach in California. Good afternoon, Tarini, and uh, welcome to the live stream. Hope you are well. Um, I, Jason is saying uh, he believes the answer to the deer question is fleish, which is the one I had suggested. Uh, yeah, could be, yeah. Um, I, I, I was confused um, momentarily. I think that might be the one. Sorry. Uh, did I miss any questions? Just going back up here through the comments and questions. Somebody else joined us. Uh, other than Tarini, I saw somebody else saying, oh yeah, Helena Breen. Uh, hello, Helena. You're very welcome to Live Irish Myths, episode number 160. Against whom? Yes, I am in terror of the Far Duraka, the dark man of the she. He, that's, this is um, um, Fiona asking uh, the fawn. He is my enemy, she said. Or, sorry, the, the, the woman. The uh, mysterious young woman who came into his room. He is mine now, said Fionn. Tell me your story. My name is Saiv. And I am a woman of the she. It's translated here into I am a woman of fairy. But I'd say in the original it is I am I am a ban she. I'm a woman of the she. She commented. In the she, many men give me their love. But I gave my love to no man of my country. That was not reasonable, the other chided with a blithe heart. I was contented, she replied. And what we do not want, we do not lack. But if my love went anywhere, it went to a mortal a man of the men of Ireland. By my hand, said Fionn, in mortal distress, I marvel who that man can be. He is known to you, she murmured. I lived thus in the peace of the she, hearing often of my mortal champion, for the rumour of his great deeds had gone through the she, until a day when came, sorry, until a day, a day came when the black magician of the men of God put his eye on me, and after that day, in whatever direction I looked, I saw his eye. She stopped at that, and the terror that was in her heart was on her face. Vicky Wallace Southerl is in the house. Good evening, Vicky, and if Evan and Chili are with you, hello also. You're very welcome to Live Irish Mits. Was that the F word? Oh, yes, loads of people pointing out. Yes, I did say it. But I mean, I said it earlier on in the title of the book and nobody batted an eyelid. Uh, yes, indeed. He is everywhere, she whispered. Sorry. He is everywhere, she whispered. Sorry, that was very masculine. 
he is everywhere, she whispered. <laughs> he is in the bushes and on the hill. He looked up at me from the water and he stared down on me from the sky. His voice commands out of the spaces and it demands secretly in the heart. He is not here or there. He is in all places at all times. I cannot escape from him, she said, and I am afraid. And at that, she wept noiselessly and stared on Fionn. He is my enemy, Fionn growled. I name him as my enemy. You will protect me, she implored. Where I am, let him not come, said Fionn. I also have knowledge. I am Fionn, the son of Ull, the son of Boshkne, a man among men and a god where the gods are. Yes, indeed, Evan is waving. Hello, Evan. Hello there. Welcome to Live Irish Myths. Barbara Murphy, I'm delighted to hear that, that uh, your Duolingo efforts worked, that you understood what Far Doraka me means. Brilliant stuff. Excellent, excellent, excellent. He asked me in marriage, she continued, but my mind was full of my own dear hero, and I refused the dark man. That was your right, and I swear by my hand uh, that if the man if the man you desire is alive and unmarried, he shall marry you, or he will answer for, to me for the refusal. He is not married, said Sive, and you have small control over him. The chief frowned thoughtfully. Except the high king and the kings, I have authority in this land. What man has authority over himself? asked Sive. Do you mean that I am the man you seek? said Fionn. It is to yourself. I gave my love, she replied. This is good news, Fionn cried joyfully. For the moment you came through the door, I loved and desired you. And the thought that you wished for another man went into my heart like a sword. Ah, I love a good romantic tale, lovely love story. Tom Lawler, please do not say the F word. Yes, I'm trying to say the she in place of that. But, uh... There's Mandy giving us even the page number. Fleish. Ah, look, I was right after after all. Why did I doubt myself? Indeed, Fionn loved Sive, as he had not loved a woman before and would never love one again. He loved her as he had never loved anything before. He could not bear to be away from her. When he saw her, he did not see the world. And when he saw the world without her, it was as though he saw nothing or as if he looked on a prospect that was bleak and depressing. The belling of a stag had been music to Fionn, but when Sive spoke, that was sound enough for him. He had loved to hear the cuckoo calling in the spring from the tree that is highest in the hedge, or the blackbird's jolly whistle in the autumn bush, or the thin, sweet enchantment that comes to mind when a lark thrills out of sight in the air, and the hushed fields listened to the song. Oh, wow. But his wife's voice was sweeter to Fionn than the singing of a lark. She filled him with wonder and surmise. There was magic in the tips of her fingers. Her thin palm ravished him. Her slender foot set his heart beating. And whatever way her head moved, there came a new shape of beauty to her face. She is always new, said Fionn. She is always better than any other woman. She is always better than herself. He attended no more to the Fianna. He ceased to hunt. He did not listen to the songs of poets or the curious sayings of magicians. For all of these were in his wife. And soothing, uh, sorry, and something that was beyond these was in her also. She is this world and the next one. She is completion said Fionn and speaking of completion that is the end of chapter two and chapter three 
it happened that the men of Lochlan came on an expedition against Ireland. A monstrous fleet rounded the bluffs of Ben Ether, that's Hoth Head in County Dublin, and the Danes landed there to prepare an attack which would render them masters of the country. We're into Viking era stuff now, that's beginning around the uh, early 800s, the 9th century. There may have been Viking activity in the late 8th century, was there? In the late 700s. But I think the real attacks began in the 9th. Fionn and the Fianna Finn marched against them. He did not like the men of Lochlan at any time, but this time he moved against them in wrath, for not only were they attacking Ireland, but they had come between him and the deepest joy his life had known. It was a hard fight, but a short one. The Loch Lanarks were driven back to their ships, and within a week, the only Danes remaining in Ireland were those that had been buried there. That finished, he left the victorious Fianna and returned swiftly to the plain of Allen, for he could not bear to be one unnecessary day parted from Sive. You are not leaving us, exclaimed Gull MacMorna. I must go, Fionn replied. You will not desert the victory feast, Conan reproached him. Stay with us, chief, Kylche begged. What is a feast without Fionn, they complained. But he would not stay. By my hand, he cried, I must go. She will be looking for me from the window. <laughs> oh, lovely. Ah, what light from yonder window breaks. That will happen indeed, Gull admitted. That will happen, cried Fionn, and when she sees me far out on the plain, she will run through the great gate to meet me. It would be the queer wife would neglect that run, Conan growled. I shall hold her hand again, Fionn entrusted to Kylche's ear. You will do that, surely. I shall look into her face, his lord insisted. But he saw that not even beloved Kylche understood the meaning of that, and he knew sadly and yet profoundly. Sorry, that's not what it says. I will read that again. And he knew sadly and yet proudly that what he meant could not be explained by anyone and could not be comprehended by anyone. You are in love, dear heart, said Kylche. In love he is, Conan grumbled. A cordial for women, a disease for men, a state of wretchedness. Wretched in truth, the chief murmured. Love makes us poor. We have not eyes enough to see all that is to be seen, nor hands enough to seize the tenth of all we want. When I look in her eyes, I am tormented because I am not looking at her lips. And when I see her lips, my soul cries out, look at her eyes, look at her eyes. That is how it happens, said Gull, rememberingly. That way and no other, Kylche agreed. And the champions looked backwards in time on these lips and those and knew their chief would go. When Fionn came in sight of his great keep, his blood and his feet quickened, and now and again he waved a spear in the air. She does not see me yet, he thought mournfully. She cannot see me yet, he amended, reproaching himself. But his mind was troubled, for he thought also, or he felt without thinking, that had the positions been changed, he would have seen her at twice the distance. She thinks I have been un unable to get away from the battle, or that I was forced to remain for the feast. And without thinking it, he thought that had the positions been changed, he would have known that nothing could retain the one that was absent. Without thinking it, he thought. Interesting. Seventh century, says Helena. Slain, yes. There was once a clog uh, around Tower at Slain, and apparently it was burned three times by the Vikings. Kaylee During, hello Kaylee, is looking forward to receiving the Mythical Ireland 2022 calendar. Brilliant stuff. It is on its way to you, Kaylee. Uh, all of the orders are up to date, apart from the ones that arrived in the late afternoon. Women, he said, are shamefaced 
They do not like to appear eager when others are observing them. But he knew that he would not have known if others were observing him and that he would not have cared about it if he had known. And he knew that his scythe would not have seen and would not have cared for any eyes than his. He gripped his spear on that reflection and ran as he had not run in his life, so that it was a panting, dishevelled man that raced heavily through the gates of the great dun. Within the dun there was disorder. Servants were shouting to one another, and women were running to and fro aimlessly, wringing their hands and screaming. And when they saw the champion, those nearest to him ran away. And there was a general effort on behalf of on the part of every person to get behind every other person. <laughs> but Fionn caught the eye of his butler, Garav Cronon, the rough buzzer, and held it. Come you here, he said. Karen Gogus has slipped in to the live stream. A, a wizard is never late, Karen Gogus. He arrives precisely when he means to. Uh, Michael Trot is also saying, Kia ora all. Uh, Slaunche and uh, a good morning to all our friends in New Zealand. Excuse me. <coughs> and the rough buzzer came to him without a single buzz in his body. Where is the flower of Alan? his master demanded. I do not know, master, his terrified servant replied. You do not know, said Fionn. Tell what you do know. And the man told him his story. And on we go to chapter four. Come you here. Love it. When you had been away for a day, the guards were surprised. They were looking from the heights of the dun, and the flower of Alan was with them. She, for she had a quest sigh, called out that the master of the Fianna was coming over the ridges to the dun. And she ran from the keep to meet you. It was not I, said Fionn. It bore your shape, replied Garav Cronon. It had your armour and your face, and the dogs, Bran and Shkjolon, were with it. They were with me, said Fionn. They seemed to be with it, said the servant humbly. Tell us the tale, cried Fionn. We were distrustful, the servant continued. We had never known Fionn to return from a combat before it had been fought. And we knew you could not have reached Ben Ether or encountered the Loch Lanox. So we urged Our Lady to let us go out to meet you, but to remain herself in the dun. It was good urging, Fionn assented. She would not be advised, the servant wailed. She cried to us, let me go to meet my love. Alas, said Fionn. Excuse me. She cried on us. Let me go to meet my husband, the father of the child that is not born. Alas, groaned deep wounded Fionn. She ran towards your appearance that had your arms stretched out to her. At that wise, Fionn put his hand before his eyes, seeing all that happened. Tell on your tale, said he. She ran to those arms, and when she reached them, the figure lifted its hand. It touched her with a hazel rod, and while we looked, she disappeared. And where she had been, there was a fawn standing and shivering. The fawn turned and bounded towards the gate of the dun, but the hounds that were by flew after her. Finn stared on him like a lost man. They took her by the throat, the shivering servant whispered. Ah, cried Fionn in a terrible voice. And they dragged her back to the figure that seemed to be Fionn. Three times she broke away and came bounding to us, and three times the dog took her by the throat and dragged her back. You stood to look, the chief snarled. No, master, we ran. But she vanished as we got to her. The great hounds vanished away, and that being that seemed to be Fionn disappeared with them. We were left in the rough grass, staring about us and at each other, 
and listening to the moan of the wind and the terror of our hearts. Forgive us, dear master, the servant cried. But the great captain made him no answer. He stood as though he were dumb and blind, and now and again he beat terribly on his breast with his closed fist, as though he would kill that within him which should be dead and could not die. He went so, beating on his breast, to his inner room in the dun, and he was not seen again for the rest of that day, nor until the sun rose over Moy Liffey in the morning. That is chapter four. On to chapter five. For many years after that time, when he was not fighting against the enemies of Ireland, Fionn was searching and hunting through the length and breadth of the country in the hope that he might again chance on his lovely lady from the Sheep. Through all that time he slept in misery each night, and he rose each day to grief. Whenever he hunted, he brought only the hounds that he trusted, Bran and Sciolon, Lomara, Rudd and Lumlu, for if a fawn was chased, each of these five great dogs would know it was sorry would know if that was a fawn to be killed or one to be protected and so there was small danger to Sive and a small hope of finding her once when seven years had passed in fruitless search Fionn and the chief nobles of the Fianna were hunting Ben Gulban all the hounds of the Fianna were out and Fionn had now given up hope of encountering the flower of Allen. As the hunt swept along the sides of the hill, there arose a great outcry of hounds from a narrow place high above the slope, high on the slope even. And over all that uproar there came the savage baying of Fionn's own dogs. What is this for? said Fionn. And with his companions he pressed to the spot whence the noise came. They are fighting all the hounds of the Fianna, cried a champion. And they were. The five wise hounds were in a circle and were giving battle to an hundred dogs at once. They were bristling and terrible and each bite from those great keen jaws was woe to the beast that received it. Nor did they fight in silence as was their custom and training, but between each onslaught the great heads were uplifted and they pealed loudly, mournfully, urgently for their master. They are calling on me, he roared. And with that, he ran, as he had only run once before. And the men who were nigh to him went racing, as they would not have run for their lives. They came to the narrow place on the slope of the mountain, and they saw the five great hounds in a circle, keeping off the other dogs. And in the middle of the ring, a little boy was standing. He had long, beautiful hair, and he was naked. He was not daunted by the terrible combat and clamour of the hounds. He did not look at the hounds, but he stared like a young prince at Fionn and the champions as they rushed towards him, scattering the pack with the butts of their spears. When the fight was over, Bran and Sciolon ran, I think it's Sciolon rather than Sciolon, there's no father on the A, so Sciolon ran whining to the little boy and licked his hands. They do that to no one, said a bystander. What new master is this they have found? Fionn bent to the boy. Tell me, my little prince and pulse, what your name is, and how you have come into the middle of a hunting pack, and why you are naked. But the boy did not understand the language of the men of Ireland. He put his hand into Fionn's, and the chief felt as if that little hand had been put into his heart. He lifted the lad to his great shoulder. We have caught something on this hunt, said he to Kylcha Macronon. We must bring this treasure home. You shall be one of the Fianna Finn, my darling, he called upwards. The boy looked down on him, and in the noble trust and fearlessness of that regard, Fionn's heart melted away. My little fawn, he said, and he remembered that other fawn. He set the boy between his knee knees and stared at him earnestly and long. There is 
surely the same look he said to his wakening heart that is the very eye of Sive. the grief flooded out of his heart as at a stroke and joy foamed into it in one great tide he marched back singing to the encampment and men saw once more the merry chief they had almost forgotten that is the end of chapter five just two more to go and they're not long chapters they're only two pages each as we are approaching 9 p.m ireland's mowgli says helena breen <laughs> yeah i'm the king of the jungle <laughs> yes and all of that Do 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 do. Sorry, got distracted there for a moment. Just at one. Sorry, hmm. start again, Anthony. Pay attention. Sandra Boothroyd is loving it. I'm not sure which part you're loving the story or the silly singing and distractions. I, I'll get straight back to it. Just as at one time he could not be parted from Sive, so now he could not be separated from this boy. He had a thousand names for him, each one more tender than the last. My fawn, my pulse, my secret little treasure. Or, he would call him, my music, my blossoming branch, my store in the heart, my soul. And the dogs were as wild for the boy as Fionn was. He could not sit in safety among a pack that would have torn any man to pieces. Sorry, read that again, Anthony. I'm making several mistakes tonight, for which I apologise. Take two. He could sit in safety among a pack that would have torn any man to pieces. And the reason was that Bran and Skjolan, with their three whelps, followed him about like shadows. When he was with the pack, these five were with him. And woeful indeed was the eye they turned on their comrades when these pushed too closely or were not properly humble. They thrashed the pack severally and collectively until every hound in Fionn's kennels knew that the little lad was their master and that there was nothing in the world so sacred as he was. Excuse me. In no long time, the five wise hounds could have given over their guardianship. So complete was the recognition of their young lord. But they did not so give over, for it was not love they gave the lad, but adoration. Fionn may have been embarrassed by their too close attendance. If he had been able to do so, he might have spoken harshly to his dogs, but he could not. It was unthinkable that he should, and the boy might have spoken harshly to him if he had dared to do it. For this was the order of Fionn's affection. First, there was the boy. Next, Bran and Skjolan and their three whelps. Then, Kylcha Macronon, and from him down through the champions. He loved them all, but it was along that precedence his affections ran. The thorn that went into Bran's foot ran into Fionn's also. The world knew it, and there was not a champion but admitted sorrowfully that there was reason for his love. Little by little, the boy came to understand their speech and to speak it himself, and at last he was able to tell his story to Fionn. There were many blanks in the tale, for a young child does not remember very well. Deeds grow old in a day and are buried in a night. New memories come crowding on old ones, and one must learn to forget as well as to remember. A whole new life had come on this boy, a life that was instant and memorable, so that his present memories blended into and obscured the past, and he could not be quite sure if that which he told of had happened in this world or in the world he had left and we're on to the final chapter of the story isn't it lovely 
Ah, yes, indeed, Caitlin. Yes, bring a tear to a glass eye. And Brendan says, um, still a feeling of great sadness in this tale. Yes, absolutely, yes. I used to live, he said, in a wide, beautiful place. There were hills and valleys there, and woods and streams. But in whatever direction I went, I came always to a cliff. So tall it seemed to lean against the sky, and so straight that even a goat would not have imagined to climb it. I do not know of any such place, Fionn mused. There is no such place in Ireland, said Kyle. Yes, we've been talking about dogs. Okay, apparently Coda wants a mention. Okay, all right. Yeah, let's pretend. Yeah, okay. Your brand, right. And Saskia can be Skiolan. By the way, it's Saskia's birthday today. Saskia is 10 today. Okay, right. I'll, I'll, you tell the story then. Fine. Right. Come on. <laughs> He's being very vocal. I think there might be somebody at the door. <laughs> there is no such place in Ireland, said Kylecha. But in the she, there is such a place. There is, in truth, said Fionn. I used to eat fruits and roots in the summer, the boy continued. But in winter, food was left for me in a cave. Was there no one with you, said Fionn. Sorry, apologies. No one but a deer that loved me, and that I loved. Ah, me, cried Fionn in anguish. Tell me your tale, my son. A dark, stern man came often after us, and he used to speak with the deer. Sometimes he talked gently and softly and coaxingly. But at times again he would shout loudly and in a harsh, angry voice. But whatever way he talked, the deer would draw away from him in dread, and he always left her at last, furiously. It is the dark magician of the men of God, cried Fionn despairingly. I'm wondering whether the men of God is uh, translated from the two a day uh, in this case. I'm not sure. I'd have to see the original. It is indeed my soul, said Kylche. The last time I saw the deer, the child continued, the dark man was speaking to her. He spoke for a long time. He spoke gently and angrily and gently and angrily so that I thought he would never stop talking. But in the end, he struck her with a hazel rod so that she was forced to follow him when they went away. She was looking back at me all the time and she was crying so bitterly that anyone would pity her. I tried to follow her also, but I could not move. And I cried after her too with rage and grief until I could see apologies for the interruption until I could see her no more and hear her no more then I fell on the grass my senses went away from me and when I awoke I was on the hill in the middle of the hounds where you found me that was the boy whom the Fianna called Oshin or the little fawn he grew to be a great fighter afterwards and he was the chief maker of poems in the world. But he was not yet finished with the she. He was to go back into F word when the time came and to come thence again to tell these tales. For it was by him these tales were told. And thus ends the charming and beautiful and also sad tale of Oshin's mother. Nice, and yet, at the same time, sad. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, fabulously told, as usual, from Stevens. Yeah, really wonderful. We're not just quite halfway through the book yet. Plenty, plenty more to come. Um, was I telling you that I, I bought a new pen that can write underwater? Fascinating stuff, I know. It can write other words too.
Not heard from Coda in ages. I wonder if I can get him in to say hello. Wait, wait for a moment. I shall ask him to proceed into the live stream. Coda, come here. Get up. Good boy. Come on in and say hello. <laughs> come on. Yeah, you come in. Maybe you can. Come on. No. He's comfortable where he is. <laughs> he's he's got his ball and he's got company in the kitchen and he just doesn't want to come in. He's like, no. Well, he wants to bark and he wants to be heard, but um next week maybe. Next week we shall uh be graced with uh with Coda's presence. Yeah. Uh the very interesting thing about all of these stories from the uh the Finn cycle. Um like they're the stories that were told um right up into the 20th century passed down through generations and generations and uh, known far and wide across ireland much more so than for instance some of the tales of uh coinbo cooling uh, etc it's fascinating stuff but they have endured um yeah lots and lots to take away from that um the she uh, uh you know opening up into this world on a hill in in uh in sligo um fabulous stuff you know that there's I, I i i don't know whether there's a sort of indications of earlier beliefs you know but i took a i took a note there that i i thought i, I thought it was interesting you know that he ate fruits and roots in the summer but in winter food was left for me in a cave and, and i just there was just something that clicked in me there saying you know, Mariam Dowd was investigating cave bones and um, there is a bear bone found in a cave in Sligo that, you know, was hacked by humans um, at the end of the last ice age. And it just brought to mind the idea that maybe these are memories of very, very distant events, you know, when literally, you know, it was so cold at times that the only place you could survive was in a cave. Uh, and uh, you know that you had to store up a load of food like like a squirrel you know uh, that you had to store up a load of food for the winter to get yourself through it you know fascinating stuff all the same um yes indeed yeah i'm really loving really loving stevens i'm so so glad that we uh um well i'm so glad that i got a, a copy of his book and uh, i think yvette got a copy as well um you can get them these are facsimile reprints uh, this one is Gill and Macmillan, which is an Irish publishing company. Um, it's only known as Gill now, um, published in 1995. Um, but it is, it's like we're so blessed and we've been blessed on this uh, series of episodes in that there's so much sort of out of print or out of copyright material from the 19th and early 20th centuries that has been republished in modern times, facsimile reprints. Um, and it, we're just we're all the richer for it because otherwise you'd be paying 120 euros for an original hardback uh, and they are in very very short supply and we might never have gotten to agree these stories if there are any questions i'll take them i'll hang around for a few minutes i'm not in any immediate rush sorry about my rant earlier on uh, in relation to COVID 19 and uh, i don't uh, wish to prolong it uh, but just to say uh, i think i spoke uh, far too long about it when i did but there you go. Um, uh, if you are one of those who is awaiting the revised and expanded uh, edition of Mythical Ireland, uh, the word is it was sent to print two weeks ago. The word is that we're hoping to have it by month's end, which is what, eight days, uh, hopefully early next week, if not maybe by this weekend, if we get a lucky break. Um, those of you who have pre-ordered Obviously, you'll be prioritized. As soon as I get copies of the book into my hands, the pre-orders will all be shipped uh, as soon as I possibly can. Um, 
Uh, Porik Byrne is suggesting that I add a new level on Patreon uh, and that uh, you can go there to uh, as a reward to avoid my jokes. <laughs> yeah, uh, good one. Yes, good idea. So this is the uh, this is the previous iteration of Mythical Ireland, New Light on the Ancient Past. The new one will not look like this. We did a cover reveal episode a couple of weeks ago. A new cover is completely different. And of course, the new book has 20,000 words of additional material in it. So hopefully, uh, if you haven't already uh, pre-ordered, uh, those can be pre-ordered at mythicalireland.com. And as usual, it's all in the gallery and shop. The gallery is where you buy photographs, photographic prints. The shop is where you, they're all part of the one sort of shop area. You buy your, your books, your calendars, your posters, and any other items. Um, I should mention that patrons at the Iron Age level and above, uh, I believe that's the $25 a month level and above, uh, do also get uh, Mythical Island merchandise, um, mugs and posters and T-shirts and that sort of thing. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Patreon rewards are not just confined to exclusives in terms of uh, pictures and podcasts and videos and um, now uh, my new book and all of that. Brendan Byrne enjoyed the story. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Blessed be blessed to be in the company of such wonderful comrades. Glad you enjoyed it, Brendan. It's always a pleasure. Absolutely. Um, uh, Mandy McCurl wants to know if I'm stealing Marty Whelan's jokes. Marty Whelan is a presenter on Lyric FM. And uh, yeah, I sure I send him half his jokes. He's stealing my jokes. What are you talking about? <laughs> Only joking. We're all getting them from the same terrible source. Um, uh, Adina Sparks enjoyed the story. Lovely, but sad. And be safe, everyone. Yes, indeed. And the same to you. For uh, and f Was that an extra fiver? You should write a joke in the book. There you go. Yeah. Maybe I'll publish a book of jokes at some point. Yes, indeed. Sandra Boothroyd will be in Spain with no internet next week. Well, that's a great complaint to be in Spain next week. Sure, who'd want to be listening to live Irish myths when you're, you know, stretch back, enjoying the sun, you know? Ah, sure, look, enjoy it, you know? Um, yeah, anyway, all all good. The Cliffs on Iron Islands, Dunangus has ancient tales of the gods, more so stone people, the ancestors pre-Celt. I often wondered, because apparently the Dunangus is named after a chieftain, not... The deity Angus, but I always said to myself, I don't know, you know, there'll be something older there, you know, maybe. Mavanway says, No, please. I presume that's to the uh, extra to the to the to the jokes. And Liam Smith said he has never heard this story before. Brilliant. Well, I'm glad that you've enjoyed it, Liam. Um Vicky is thanking us for keeping her spot. Always a great delight to do that, Vicky. Always great to see you. Chungus Khan, thank you for your very nice message. And that's lovely. Thank you for saying that. Goromahagut Makara. And uh, yeah, thanks for saying it. Mighty Broadcast, says Tom King. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, friends of the two. Stay safe out there until next time. Keep the fire burning, Tom. Hope to get out to you again before too long. And uh, yeah, there'll be Rira August Rulia Bulia. Chat and uh, forging and few jokes maybe you know and all that um obviously as soon as i have definite word as to exactly when the new edition of mythical ireland is arriving i will publicize that uh, on the facebook page and the twitter and the instagram and all of that and maybe sherlock we might even do a live stream you know but in the meantime uh, until next time uh, that's all i have for you this evening I'm sorry. I know you'd like more. And I know you'd like me to go on all evening, except for the jokes. But that's it. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Conrad, thank you for keeping the magical F word alive. <laughs> I'm glad to be able to do so. And uh, good night to Tarini. Yvette really enjoyed that story. Brilliant. And as did Anne McCallum. Yes, Anne, a very touching story. Charlie, loving your podcast at the minute. Might as well join for the live stream. Brilliant. Yeah, well, look, the more the merrier. Great place to spend the winter as well. Winter evenings made shorter by storytellings and, if you call them, 
jokes. Hang on, wait till I see if I have another one. I don't remember them too well. You know? I'm terrible at remembering jokes these days. When I was 20, I could rhyme off two hours worth of jokes. Singing, singing in the shower is great until you get shampoo in your mouth. Then it's a soap opera. Ah, yes, 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 yes. I, you, you all, uh, you all saw my Bronze Age joke. Oh yeah, I just joined a band called Bubble Wrap. All we do is pop. Good night, everyone. Take it handy. Slongafol, Kulasov, Ikawa, Togabuge. Take it easy. Until next time. And thank you for your time this time. Until next time. Uh, if anybody can tell me who says that, <laughs> I'll give you a calendar for nothing. Good luck, folks. See you again. Thanks for joining us. Good night from the Boyne Valley. Stay safe. Stay well. Tune in again soon.